Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Amit, for the great introduction. It's, it's actually my first time to be in the series. I really want to join the last few times, but uh, it was like I was doing the packing and moving around. So I, it's my first time and I'm glad to be here. It's good to know that all both of the previous talk is about HCI. So it's, I think I'm at the right place to talk about research. So, so yeah, everybody, uh, it's been a great pleasure to be here. And uh, we can just get started. So let's First, take a look back 60 years ago. And this photo shows a nurse using a mechanical watch to take a patient's pulse. And back then, pulse reading was only possible with the help of a clinician. Yet it was often inaccurate due to all kinds of manual error. And because of the shortage of clinicians, such a hospital care was only limited to a small number of people, causing a population gap. And in many cases, people will often have to schedule multiple clinical visits with intervals, which are often several months or even years. And most health concerns tend to happen within these intervals outside clinical settings. And in those uncontrolled environments, it was often hard and difficult for the healthcare provider to collect the useful information about the patient's health. And this is called the temporal gaps. So 60 years later, we made tremendous progress in the healthcare technology but yet these two gaps still exist. Not everyone can easily access the healthcare resources and collecting high quality behavior data outside the clinical settings is still a big challenge. And this is especially true when we're talking about long-term health and well-being such as mental health. But we made some progress. In the past decade, these AI powered everyday devices have becoming more and more popular in our daily life. The smartphone is one of the most ubiquitous device in the world. They cover over 80% of the global populations and can offer a way to close the population temporal gaps by passively collecting high resolution behavior data. So now we can imagine a bright future. Using this data about our behavior, we can first build our long-term behavior modeling techniques to detect these health concerns. And then based on behavior models, we can develop intelligent behavior intervention techniques to influence our behavior and address these health concerns. Using AI techniques, we can then create the next generation of the intelligent systems to improve our well-being. Sounds like a very good plan, but apparently we're not there yet. So what are the challenges? Well, although AI has been doing a great job in many applications, nowadays, even, but nowadays even the most advanced AI like the recent ChatGPT, they may still fail in some of the real-world deployment, especially in-house. So deployability has been one of the most important challenges for complex AI problems, and this is especially true for our case with AI for health on our everyday devices. And actually, some of the AI algorithms have been pretty deployable. Devices can already detect our basic health behaviors like physical activities and heart rate through those devices. However, they're not able to understand or monitor our high-level, long-term behaviors, such as our daily routines or mental well-beings, Early research about these long-term behaviors is still far from being deployable in the real world. And that's where my research comes in. Coming back to this figure, the majority part of my research have been mainly focused on developing deployable AI techniques for both behavior modeling and intervention on our everyday devices. Of course, there are other important challenges, such as the privacy concerns or ethical concerns about the technology that's gonna model and influence our behavior. But here, we need to first answer this fundamental research question of whether this behavior modeling and intervention pipeline is even possible before we can answer other concerns. And in fact, addressing these concerns are also on my future research agenda. So in today's talk, let's focus on the deployability challenges of behavior modeling and intervention. And to do this, we need joint efforts from two sides. We should combine computer science and health science to develop a complete behavior modeling and intervention pipeline. And in order to create a effective interactive systems, we also need human-centered design. Moreover, we also need insights into those real-world long-term studies that spans multiple months or even years to identify the opportunities and risk of the technology deployment. And as a researcher, I will call it intersection of all of them. But combining all these efforts, my ultimate goal is to create an interactive systems based on our everyday devices to precisely understand, model, and influence our long-term behavior for better health and well-being. 
and that's my vision of the computational longitudinal well-being. And here I use a earth and mountains as a metaphor for my research, where on the bottom, I develop deployable behavior modeling algorithms to monitor users' long-term health and well-being conditions at scale. And here I use a bottom-up strategy that I innovate in the German techniques to generate the findings and view behavior models. And then I find the literatures and theories from our behavior science to support those findings. And based on these behavior models, I will mainly focus on two aspects of applications. On one side, I create deployable behavior intervention techniques to help us improve their well-beings. And here I use a top-down theory-driven strategy that may leverage behavior change theories or behavior science theories to guide my designs, and then I conduct deployment studies to collect data and verify the hypothesis. On the other side, to further support the self-interest of, of users besides chaos, I also develop some intelligent interaction techniques using deployable behavior models. So today I won't be able to cover all of them. I'm going to first start with behavior modeling. We're going to mainly focus on developing new AI algorithms to address three key deployability challenges. The first is generalizability, which focuses on making our model to be able to work robustly on the new users in a new environment. Second, personalization, which focuses on adapting the model to each individual. And the third, interpretability, which focuses on eroding human readable insights from our behavior data and models. And given the time, I'm going to mainly introduce two parts, the generalizability and the interpretability, where I'm going to introduce the new algorithms that we developed to address these two challenges, which outperform the state of the art by at least 4 to 10%. And then I'm going to move on to the intervention to show how I can put the results of these insights of these behavior models into this actual deployment. And I'm going to use mainly use mental health as an example in today's talk to connect everything in, in today's uh, this, this presentation. Things, this is one of the major long-term health challenges across the world. But my, my technique can also be applied to other domains as well. Okay, so now let's first start with the generalizability, which is one of the biggest challenges in the field of the behavior modeling. To see why we need generalizability, let me first show you where we are right now. So researchers usually collect sensor data from users over several weeks to capture their daily behavior, and then we label it through surveys or clinical diagnosis. And our job is to use this sensor data to predict certain behavior outcomes, such as whether the user has depression or not. And compared to other typical machine learning data, like the computer vision and NLP task, our data is more heterogeneous because we have more sensors from different modalities. We usually have a very long sequence that spans over several weeks or even months, sometimes even years. And missing data is often inevitable due to all kinds of software and hardware issues. Moreover, our label is often very sparse, especially for mental health, that we cannot, we cannot collect labels to be more frequent than like once a week or once every two weeks. So this is already a very demanding process with a pretty challenging machine learning problem that we spend a significant amount of time and resources even just to collect our data sets. So it's, a very, it's very uncommon for the researchers to share the data sets, and lots of research has been based on each group's their own single and private data sets. And this will lead to two big gaps. First, everyone is using their own single data sets. But in our real life deployment with new users and new environments, the user behavior can often be different and the data can have different distributions. So generalizing a model to a unseen data sets or a real world deployment is often very hard. And the robustness of the AI models on a single data set may just not be valid. Since Second, since everyone is not releasing their data sets, the reproduci reproducibility of these behavior models is actually unclear. And there's no standard benchmark that can compare different algorithms. So our field has been stuck with these two challenges for almost uh, more than five years. And we need two things. First, we should evaluate and improve a behavior model's cross data sets generalizability to enable our real world deployment with a robust performance. Second, we need to have an open source data system platform to enable a systematic and reproducible comparisons among different algorithms. So we need to move from this single private data sets to this public multiple data sets. To address these gaps, I need a great team to collect the first multi-year processing data sets from 2018 to 2021. For, uh, at UW. And actually, we just finished our two more studies in the past two years and have six years in total. So here, each spring, we collect data for three months. And overall, our data sets contain over 700 people in total and around 500 unique people. And to ensure diversity, we also recruit people with diverse gender, racial, ability, and immigration backgrounds. 
We collect the behavior data from smartphones and wearables, and based on literature, we extracted a wide range of features, such as travel distance or location geography from the GPS mobility data, and also the number of unlocks interactions from the screen data. And these are just two examples. We also collect the self report data as a ground truth. We use both weekly EMAs, which are short surveys, and also long questionnaires to cover various health and well beings uh, conditions at the start and the end of each study. And for this talk, I'm going to mainly use mental health as an example. So here we use BDI2 for the end of term depression measure and a PHQ4 for the frequent mental distress measure. And we start with a binary classification task to determine whether someone had at least mild depressive symptoms as depression is one of the major, major mental health challenges across the world. And here we call it as a depression prediction task, but just to be accurate, we're not, we're not talking about clinical depression, but it's more about self-report results, which is a pre-screening stage for most of the standard clinical diagnosis process. And I can tell you that this collection process was no small feat. It took a lot of hard work, including the updating our data, data collection framework every year and the closely managing our participants to ensure the quality of the data and also protecting the privacy when exposing our datasets. And now we're very excited to say that we have open source our datasets to the whole research community. And this is re really exciting because for the first time, we enable other researchers to be able to develop tests and compare different longitudinal behavior model elements on such a multi-year multi and a public dataset. And to further increase the diversity, I also led a collaboration with CMU and Dharmas, bringing our total datasets to over 1,400 users. And this is by far the largest, also the first multi-year, multi-institution datasets. And now we can do some important analysis that no one can ever do it before. As you can imagine, our long-term studies can capture various behavior patterns. Here are some example features in the datasets. Each line represents one year. First, we can see the weekly cycle, where students tend to be less active and get more sleep on weekends. Moreover, since our studies spans the COVID, we can also see the impact of COVID, which leads to the fewer step counts and also more screen usage. And after you have COVID, the step counts start to go back up, which is encouraging. There are also some interesting reverse peaks, where before COVID, students tend to be less active and work less on weekends, while after COVID, they actually tend to be work more on weekends, So, which shows they become a new normal. Unfortunately, if you look at their smartphone usage time, they just never went down after COVID. Oops, sorry. This, they just never, this just never went down. And on the bright side, our sleep duration was less impacted and actually went a bit, uh, went up a bit after COVID. So overall here, we can observe the distribution differences between state assets, which kind of indicates the challenges of a cost of a, <clears throat> to make a machine learning model to be able to work across different data sets. But you may think, well, this is mainly because of COVID, right? <clears throat> if you look at data sets before COVID, the distribution actually looks like pretty similar. However, our experiments show that even generalizing between these years is also very difficult. <clears throat> to see this, we took eight prior depression prediction algorithms. Half of them focused on the end of term prediction and the other half focused on frequent prediction. And here are their results in their papers, which look pretty promising. However, when we closely reproduce these models and in test them on our new data sets, we observe a substantial performance drop, around 15 to 25% of the accuracy. Especially for those frequent prediction models, the accuracy was no better than a random guess. So through some digging, we find that these models were not able to effectively handle the distribution shifts. So we can visualize the data in this representation space. Initially, every person from each data set had their own small own clusters because they have their unique distributions, making it challenging for a single classifier to do the job. So here, we need more advanced algorithms. And this is where the recent advances in the machine learning come into handy, with all kinds of domain generalization techniques that focus on generalizing a model to some unseen data sets. This is exactly what we need. So we borrow from them and implemented eight types of deep learning algorithms and cover four major categories and build 50 models. And here I use a gray color because you don't have to remember any of them, but just a takeaway that our adults show that none of these models can generalize well on our data sets. Well, this is mainly because that these models were really designed for computer vision or NLP task, which does not fit well with our time series parts of sensing behavior data. So if you look at the space again, these domain generalization techniques will try to map the data from different individuals into the same space, same area, but they're not able to do a good job since none of them can actually capture the, gen the generalizable part of our human behavior data. And my belief is that instead of using those complex methods, we should go back to simple and leverage the behavior science and the fundamental human behavior nature to address this challenge. And this is where I propose a new method called reorder. 
So based on deep learning time series model, we want to create a new task. At first, slice our data, and then shuffle their temporal order, and then choose a separate task to reconstruct its original order, which becomes a multi-task learning setup. So this looks pretty simple, right? This idea is inspired by solving a jigsaw puzzle in computer vision, which was used to capture the continuity of object, uh, of object shapes and contours. <clears throat> but here, we leverage this concept in a novel way. We combine it with behavior science and use such a concept to capture the behavior continuity in our behavior routines. So let me explain the intuition behind this technique. What do we mean, what do we mean by this behavior continuity? So let's look at an example of our behavior data, such as the heart rate sequence of a game. So let's say now you start with a normal heart rate for a few hours, and then you go for an exercise, which push your heart rate into a peak, and then you cool down for a few hours, and then you go to sleep, which lowers your heart rate a bit because you lie down, which is a pretty typical and healthy day. Now here, this heart rate data is a continuous temporal sequence that reflects the daily routines of your daily behavior. If we break this continuity and change this temporal order, this sequence is gonna look pretty weird. Here's this example. It's like you warm up a body and then you take a nap and then you jump to exercise after a nap, which makes no sense compared to the original temporal order. In such a continuous routines, it's also reflected in other sensor data, such as the uh, screen time usage, where you may check your phone maybe at a certain times of the day, or the distance from home, where you may leave the home in the morning and then come back home at night. And these data are all continuous, and such a continuity is pretty common among almost everyone. Here, I'm not saying that the shape is going to be the same, because everyone has their own unique behavior patterns, but it's more about the property of being continuous, because this is a pretty general human behavior nature. So such an observation inspires us with a key concept behind the reorder that we can improve our model's generalizability by learning this general behavior nature of the behavior continuity. So come back to this figure again. In this multi-task learning setup, the secondary ordering task is designed to capture such a behavior continuity. Since it's a pretty common and general human behavior nature, some of these two tasks would help the model to extract more generalizable representations about our behavior so that we can do a better job on depression prediction. Now, if we look at the space again, after adding this reordering task, learning such a general behavior continuity may lead to more domain invariant embeddings, making the data points to be closer and easier to classify. And that's how our new algorithm reorder kind of work. In order to evaluate this technique, we first use a leave one data set out setup. And now with our standard data sets, for the first time, we can finally compare all different algorithms, including the previous depression prediction algorithms, the domain generalization techniques we borrowed from the machine learning community, and also our new technique reorder. And our results show that most of the models have just around 48 to 52 percent of balance accuracy, which means that they do not have enough generalizability in our data sets. And the reorder can significantly outperform the other methods by around 4 to 10 percent. And so, as I as I'll mention later, this results are still not promising, which also indicate a lot of potential for future work. Moreover, also at the first time, our rich data sets can even support more evaluations. We can do pre-post COVID, which they take data sets before COVID for training and those after COVID for testing and vice versa. We can also do cross-institution evaluation, which they take data sets for one institution for training and the others for testing. Moreover, we also have users who attended the more than one year of study at UW, so we can also train and test models with the same users from different data sets. And our results indicate that reorder consistently ranks the top one or two for all these tasks. Note that this uh, top one algorithm for the constitution is my other work about presentation. Moreover, but in, but in general, this shows that leveraging behavior continuity is an effective and a robust approach. And to further contribute to the community, we also consolidate all these methods and develop the first open source benchmark platform called Global. It is a one-stop shop for rapid testing of over 25 existing methods and also provide templates for researchers to develop their own algorithms. And with our open source data sets, this platform enables systematic and reprodu reproducible comparisons among different algorithms. And this platform was released a few months ago. It's already got over 100 stars uh, on, on, on GitHub. And we have received a lot of interest from universities and companies for collaboration. So I'm very much looking forward to it. And to summarize this part, First, we release the first multi-year data set platform to advance our long-term behavior model research. And second, with the project prediction as example, we, for the first time, highlight a lack of generalizability in the previous behavior models. And third, we develop the reorder that is designed for our long-term behavior data and the leverage behavior continuity to improve our model's generalizability. Okay, so now let's go back to agenda and we just cover the bottom part. 
<clears throat> However, there are still some problems remains. Most of the humanoid research, including the one that I've just introduced, have been mainly focused on getting better and better accuracies. But in order to build a trustworthy and deployable behavior models, it should also help us to get more interpretations and the insights of users from this behavior data. And this leads to our next topic, interpretability. Know that, know that here this definition of interpretability is a different, it's a little different from the typical interpretable, explainable AI or machine learning that focus on understanding how the models work. Here, we we'll focus on more understanding how human operates instead of models. So in addition to having high accuracy, we also need algorithms to review this relationship between our daily routines and also our target behavior outcomes like depression. For any users, these interpretable results can help them for better self-reflection and build better trust with AI systems. And for domain experts, it can provide a deeper understanding of the user behavior, which can inspire by the therapy or intervention design. But previous methods do not provide enough interpretability. So over a few weeks, researchers collect data, like for example, sleep quality from Fitbit. And the common practices are to calculate some stats, like the average sleep quality and use it as a feature, or fit our raw data into an end-to-end -end black box model. And in such models, we can only interpret them by using the feature importance analysis. And this is not enough because you treat the feature as a whole and there's no low level daily or hourly interpretation for these different features. It's also hard to see that how these different features from different sensors are related to each other. So here we need a new method to help us to better understand this fine-grained relationship between multiple features and heart behavior like depression, but also having a good model performance. And now let's take a different view of our data. Instead of looking at a single feature, like sleep quality, we know that smartphones can capture data from multiple sensors at the same time. So we can see each window as actually a set of behavior features with some co-occurrence relationships. For example, if you see the data from the GPS and the phone usage, we might find something like if a user are at home, they tend to have a longer screen time usage. This rule is actually pretty simple and easy to understand. And this inspires us with a key idea to achieve better interpretability that we can use a set of behavior rules like if this and then that to capture and understand our daily behavior. So how to get these rules? Again, like what I did in the previous part where I combined existing machine learning concepts with behavior science, here you can leverage a technique called association rule mining. This is a pretty classic but popular data mining technique that was first used to analyze the supermarket purchase data. Like if a customer buys beers, what are the chances for them to also buy diapers? And the rule can have some coefficients like support and confidence to describe how frequent it is. And in another case, we can repurpose association rule mining. We can replace these items with different feature values and find the frequent behavior patterns from the data, like the probability of having a long screen time usage when the users are at home. And here we can define this feature X, like being at home, as the context of a target feature Y. Okay, so now we can apply association rule mining to the depressive users and non depressive users and find each of their frequent behavior patterns with a set of behavior rules. But now let's think about among these rules, which rules are actually more effective and useful. So our goal is to differentiate the depressive users from those non depressive users. Right? So here, these effective rules should actually help us to capture the behavior differences between these two groups. And now let me give you a real-world example of the effective rules for our data sets. So here, this context acts show that a student is mostly on campus during the day, and the Bluetooth sensors indicate that interaction with diverse people on campus and the feature Y is about having a good sleep quality at the night. Such a rule is actually easy to understand. It is a pretty healthy, social, and sleep lifestyle. And given such a rule, we propose a new type of feature called the contextual effective feature. So we use this context act to select a subset of the time window to fulfill it and only calculate the aggregation of target feature Y within this subset. In such a way, the feature could contain less noise in the context of this rule. So to see why this rule is more powerful, we found that the average sleep quality under this context is significantly better among the non-depressive students compared to the depressive students. And this is supported by psychology literature that the disturbed sleep pattern is a common depressive symptom. But if we just compare the overall average sleep quality across the whole period, such a difference is actually not significant. And this indicates how useful this rule is. And such a rule can not only help us to better understand user's behavior, but also extract more powerful features to distinguish these two groups of users. And this is the type of effective rule that we're looking for. But that example was just manually picked by me. 
right? Associative mining is going to generate tons of different behavior rules. So here, we need a new technology, like computation methods, to help us to automatically find these effect rules to capture differences between the, 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 between the two, between two user groups. So here's what we do. Given a behavior rule on both sides with their own support and confidence, we propose a new metric based on three characteristics. The first is called confidence difference, which highlights rules with different conditional probabilities. The second is context difference, which highlights rules with different frequencies that context acts. And the third is called context specificity, because we want to avoid rules that's overly broad, which is like one item in the X, like being on campus, which is not very informative. We want X to be as long and as specific as possible. Since these three values are different scales, we merge them by multiplication and add three ways to adjust their relative importance. I get, we got this new metric M. Now we can use this to select effective rules that can capture behavior differences between two sides. And this is a step that provides better interpretations of user behavior. And as for the classification, we extract the contextually for the features using these rules and then train the off-the-shelf machine learning classifier to the prediction. Know that here this population is different from the multiple fitting. We evaluate methods from two perspectives. With a single data set, our technique outperforms the reorder that we just introduced in the, in the previous part and also all the other baselines by more than 10% on both balance accuracies and effort score. Moreover, with the cross data set setup, it achieves pretty comparable performance with reorder and a rank among the top five in many generalization tasks. But having a better performance is just one aspect. More importantly, our technique can provide a better interpretation of our user behavior. And this is a heat map showing the frequencies of set of behavior rules, which is a y axis over a quarter. The brighter the color is, the more frequent it is the, among students at that given point of time. So here we can see that some rules become more or less frequent around the midterm time. So we dug deeper and found that the more frequent rules about their, their study behaviors and the less frequent rules about their high quality sleep patterns or social life. So actually this changes during, during the midterm exams become very understandable. This also shows that our technique can capture users uh, multiple perspectives of, daily, of their daily routines. And more importantly, we also want to know about how their behavior patterns are different between the group with and without depression symptoms. For example, for the rule that we've seen before about their locations, Bluetooth, and sleep, the depressed students had a 30% less frequent than non-depressed students about having a good sleep quality. And another common rule about their locations and the phone usage indicate that the depressed students had it over 20% more frequent about having a longer and more frequent smartphone usage, which could indicate the difficulty of focusing. Again, these interpretations are supported by literature that both disturbed sleep patterns and also lack of focus are common depressive symptoms. And such a difference is actually not significant if you only inspect the general average sleep quality or screen time. So compared to previous work, we only analyze a single feature, our technique can narrow down to some more specific context to provide a more fine-grained interpretation. Note that here, this current behavior rules only indicate association and the correlation, but not causality yet, which is a part of important work that we're exploring right now in the future. So here, just to summarize this part of interpretability, first we propose the number, the first algorithms to generate the interpretable rules to help us to better understand our long-term behaviors. And second, our results show that this new technique can achieve both better model performance and also deeper behavior interpretation. Third, many empirical findings from these rules can validate the existing psychology or psychiatry literature, but some rules also show some interesting new findings. So we're working with psychologists to see how these rules can inspire the potential future research directions and better intervention designs. And now that I mentioned intervention, I want to move on to the next topic. So I've covered a part of the interpretability and the generalizability, and also have more explorations on the behavior modeling side, such as presentations and others. But for the sake of time, I want to move on to the next chunk. So we know that building behavior models is of course very important, but in order to deploy these models, we also need to bring these models back to users. So here, I take a very different approach. Based on these behavior models, I also create a deployable intervention technique to influence the behavior and improve their well-beings. And here, I want to quickly introduce one example that's built on the top of the interpretations of the depression model. So given that we now have some AI models about our, about our depression, the next step, straightforward step, will be to introduce AI for intelligent intervention for depression. However, there are a lot of ethical challenges. What if AI made a wrong decision? What if it caused the user to feel even worse, etc.? So deploying mental health AI for intervention is very dangerous before we can answer these questions. So here, we need to design a, and test a technique in a relatively safer context. 
And as we had just seen, my work on interpretability showed that depression has a strong association with smartphone overuse. Although the causal relationship between these two sides is still unclear, I start with the smartphone overuse intervention before tackling depression because it may the later on in, may involve high health risk. And in fact, there's a growing population struggling with the smartphone overuse and addiction. So there, there are already many intervention techniques to help users to reduce their smartphone usage. However, most of them either block users' access to their phones or apps, which can lead to a bad experience as users may lose their agency. Another option is to send notifications as reminders, which can be easily ignored. So researchers recently proposed a just-in-time typing approach where user needs to enter a series of random digits or passwords before accessing their phone. However, this typing content is not meaningful for users. So now we're standing in the middle of this dilemma. We need to find a balance between the already restricted blocking and also already loose notifications. And also the state-of-the-art typing process has the challenges of interpretability for the end users. Meanwhile, most of these three types of technique are not personalized to each individual. So these are again related to the deployment challenges of the interpretability and the presentation. Moreover, for the behavior change, theories are really important to us to ensure the effectiveness of the intervention and manage our health risk. So in addition to the bottom-up data-driven strategy in the previous two parts, here I also leverage a top-down strategy to use the theories from behavior science to guide the design and then conduct data to verify our hypothesis. So here we dive really deep into the behavior change psychology and use something called self-affirmation theory, which has proven to be effective in psychology. Self-affirmation theory states that reminding users of their internal goals or identities can motivate them to maintain their self-integrity with those goals, leading to the behavior change. For example, if a user thinks that being self-disciplined is important and can remind them about this goal, they, can, they may change their non-disciplined behavior so that this claim can stay valid. And then they can protect their self-integrity as they are still someone who can be perceived as self-disciplined. So a typical self-affirmation intervention, you should ask you to do a questionnaire or go through a writing exercise. However, there's no prior work leveraging self-affirmation in a just-in-time manner. So on the one hand, there's a lack of the content design for the just-in-time type intervention. And on the other hand, there's an opportunity to equip self-affirmation in a just-in-time manner. So we discovered that these two parts can complement each other. Given this, we create type out, a just-in-time, interpretable, and the personalized intervention technique that invests a brief self-affirmation task into this typing content. Our design has two parts. First, a typing-based unlock process has introduced additional interaction costs to reduce, to decrease its benefit of use. Second, the value-based self-affirmation content that connects users' personal values and their overuse behavior to increase the benefit of use. We hypothesize that the combination of these two parts can effectively reduce the smartphone usage. The user can first set up their personalized method list, like self-discipline for you and being healthy for me. And then we can make the intervention more intelligent by using behavior rules defined by users, which are similar to those we have shown before in the interpretability part. And when the user is about to access the app and the intervention pops up, it will ask you to type an interpretable sentence like, I value self-discipline. I think I choose to leave the app anytime you are typing or still access the app after typing. And in order to evaluate these techniques, we need a real-world deployment study in the, in, in the wild as we need to see that whether it can actually influence the behavior in an uncontrolled environment. And this is an important part of my research methodology. So we conducted a study with 54 users over a 10-week period, which where the first weeks was usually collect their behavior before they see any, any of the interventions. And then they're going to go through a different technique for the rest of the time. <clears throat> and we compare type out for the, against two other techniques. The first asks you to type just in time, but just with random content named type your own. The second shows the self-affirmation synthesis, but just in a weaker way, just with a pop-up window instead of typing. So we call it as a content only. And each of them takes half of our design and our hypothesis, and they both belong to the common existing intervention techniques. Now the problem without indicate that type out is actually more effective. Specifically, it achieves a higher intervention acceptance rate. Here, this number means that when a user source a type of intervention, almost 60% of the time, they will accept it and they stop using the phone, which is significantly higher than the other techniques. Moreover, it can further effectively reduce the smartphone user frequency and durations by more than 25% compared to the baseline week, which is again, significantly better than other methods. Besides, in our final interviews, <clears throat> participants also comment that type out is actually easier to understand and has higher usability. And these results show that embedding a brief self-affirmation self task into the timing intervention is actually more effective. 
excuse me. Okay, so here I quickly introduce one example of intervention. Just to quickly wrap up, we propose the first intervention technique that combines the self-information theory and adjusting time design. We apply it to the smart for overuse based on the inter interpretation of depression prediction models. And our, our, our deployment study validates our interpretable and personal designs of type. Okay, so I have just, just shown a complete pipeline from the behavior modeling to the understanding and then influencing the behavior for the well-being improvement. And then coming back to my research roadmap, I also have another chunk of work that use my behavior models for more deployable, intelligent interaction techniques. So I won't be able to cover them in this talk. I will talk about it later. But now I want to talk about some of the future directions to achieve my vision of this computational longitudinal well-being. So I start with more depth to address the deployability challenges. Although I have shown a pathway towards a deployable AI in the daily life, there are many more exciting challenges to be addressed. For instance, the example of behavior intervention technique introduced is not intelligent enough. We are still at the early stage of intelligent just-in-time adaptive intervention. We need, more intelligent, we, we need more intelligent to decide when, what, and how to introduce interventions to users based on their reactions, using techniques like reinforcement learning to adapt to each user and have the most effective outcomes. So I'm leading a group of students on this topic to make our machine learning-based intervention to be more personalized and adaptive to the behavior change. Moreover, the recent search of the larger language model also brings up some exciting opportunities for us to developing new intervention pipelines. Can we provide users context information and let the larger, larger language models to generate diverse and appropriate persuasive context? And how to build an adaptive LLM for each user based on their reactions and preferences? My collaborators and I are actively conducting studies right now to explore the potential and effectiveness of larger language model for intervention. But this will also trigger a range of ethical concerns. What if the model generates inappropriate or even dangerous content and how to prevent its negative consequences? So one promise direction is to involve the end users or experts in the design process and in an interaction loop to address the ethical risk of the pure AI-driven intervention. And these exciting directions can involve a wide range of the human AI interaction research questions that needs expertise from the machine learning, HCI, and health. And as a researcher, I do all of them. I'm excited to explore them in my future career. Meanwhile, if we go back to the first step of behavior modeling, there are also a ton of open research questions to be addressed. Although I have made a progress in making a model to be more interpretable, personalized, and generalizable, these topics are not done yet. For example, the accuracy of this cross answer generalizability is still far from deployable, only with like 60% of the accuracy. We need much more research in the future work to improve the performance. Meanwhile, there are also more deployment challenges. For example, all the current research assumes that we can access users' raw sensor data, which could trigger some privacy concerns. So I'm excited to explore some new edge computing techniques like federated learning to make our model to be more privacy preserving. Besides, fairness is another important topic, but I also understudy in our field. Do these behavior models can work robustly for different population groups? If not, how can we minimize the bias? So now, with our diverse population groups and multiple different institutions in our unique data sets, we are working on these topics to tackle these challenges. And besides depth, I also want to briefly talk about the future potential breadth, the expansions of my research. So in the past few years, I've been mainly focused on the building the behavior modeling and intervention pipeline for mental health, but that's only one aspect of my daily life. I also want to explore other applications like physical health and education so that the system can monitor multiple aspects of our daily well-being. And besides, I'm also very interested in deployment research in the clinical settings to see how these different interpretations and the predictions could help the patients and, and the clinicians. And there can be more applications. And the goal here is to create a comprehensive system with a general intelligence to cover the multiple health and well-being aspects of our life. Moreover, from the platform perspective, my current solutions, as you may have noticed, mainly include those common devices like smartphones and smartwatches, but these are there are more emerging platforms such as edge wearables, AR, VR, and IoT, et cetera. I have done early research in these platforms, but, not, but they are not integrated into our pipeline yet. So this is another chunk of work I'm excited to explore. How can we leverage data from these platforms with different modalities? How can we distribute our behavior models across these platforms? And how about an intervention and interaction experience? By answering these research questions, I plan to build an expensive human behavior sensing network. And my previous collaboration experience with domain experts for different applications and also with industries for different competition platforms can help me explore these directions in my future career. So I'm pretty, pretty excited about it. And combining all these efforts, I want to build the next generation of intelligent ecosystems to achieve a vision of a computational functional well-being. Imagine a future where everyone can design their own smart assistant. 
And such a smart assistant can be distributed around all different devices. It can not only track our basic health behaviors, but also really understand and help us to achieve our long-term goals for better health and well-being. And that's the future I want to build. So my research also has benefits significantly from the collaboration. So in the, this last slide, I want to just take some time to thank my collaborators from a number of countries and different institutions, including uh, uh, several co several companies. I look forward to keeping connection with them in my future career. So making this slide is definitely a uh, refresh of my memory of these fantastic collaborations uh, for the awesome people in the past few years. It's also rewarding to see that our work has led to great publications and impact in the real world. And again, I thank uh, Ahmed and also other people to attend the talk. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Orson. That's an amazing presentation. Uh, I have Thanks. first a non-technical question, which is like, what do you use for your slides? <laughs> what do you use for slides? I use keynotes. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Um, thank you so much. So going back to the like the real world deployment aspect, um, like can you talk more about like how you evaluate the effectiveness of an intervention, especially when you have longitudinal data? Like, do you run like do you use randomization to kind of compare two groups, or do you leverage historical data to kind of evaluate the effectiveness effectiveness of the intervention? Yes, that's a very good question, and um. So overall here, what we've done is because we introduced a new in a new kind of intervention technique you have never used before, right? So it's actually hard to leverage the historical data. So what we actually do here is like over the 10 week period, we have, we, we uh, our first, our design is a within subject design. So it's like comparing within groups. So each user is gonna go through all these three techniques. So in this 10 week period, what we do is the first week gonna be used to collect their baseline behaviors where they have tendency end of the interventions. So just like uh, they're only in some app to monitor their usage and just uh, on daily basis without just the closest to their actual usage in the previous kind of like behaviors. And then we're going to introduce the three intervention techniques one after another uh, in, in a randomized order and each of them are going to take three weeks. So in these three weeks, we're going to have have the user to use the intervention for two weeks, and then we have a break week of one week so that user won't be impacted by previous intervention. So it could be the user already get a good habits for using, for example, type out, and so that it might impact the, the evaluation for the rest of them. So we basically, it's a one week of baseline, two week intervention, break week, two week intervention, break week, and two week intervention, and break week. And during this whole week period, we clocked all their smartphone usage frequencies and durations, and also to see whether they accept the interventions or not during this uh, period. So we have an app running in the background of user's phone to collect all this data in the real time so that we can calculate compared to the first baseline week for each user, how much behavior, how much usage they have been reduced, how much they have been, or, or more use, how, how do they interact or react to the interventions. So that's how we do the uh, like measurement evaluation for these different techniques. Yeah. So. Like a related question, like I'm, I'm kind of used to like pharmaceutical interventions that work in an objective way. But when you are evaluating behavioral interventions, like do they do they expire in terms of their effectiveness? Like when you are running a study to evaluate the effectiveness of a behavior intervention, for how long are you tracking the outcomes? Because like maybe the effects of these interventions wane, or people just like adjust their behaviors over time so that the intervention is not like working anymore like how do you think about these issues that's that that's a fantastic question so so right now uh what we have for now at this point is like for this 10 week period we we're trying our best to like not involve the user at all just like just, just the app is always running in the background only the intervention gonna pop up so the, the observer effect will hopefully be less so we, we're hoping to see that it's more closer to the actual data usage and another perspective about your question is how about the long-term measurement right and this is a very important topic that we would love to would love to explore. But in our case, uh, we did not kind of kind of conduct a, the, like a long long future study for keep monitoring them for the next like a year, which is I think once we get the app to be more kind of um, stable and also can be released on the on on, on this kind of uh, platform like iOS or Android, we will definitely be able to have a chance to see if they are actually adjust people's long term behavior in the long run. But um, this is actually beyond the focus of this study. Yeah, that sounds um, reasonable. So one last question for me before we see if other people have questions is like for the self-supervised, the reorder model, like the self-supervised learning approach, 
to what extent is it a problem of small sample size? Because it's like, even though we have collected a lot of data, but still in like deep learning terms, like you did, you had 1400 samples. Uh, so do you think like the reorder, the marginal gain from you, from using reorder or any sub-supervisory approach, is this fixing like a small sample size problem? And could you have leveraged other behavioral data that's not annotated, that's easy to collect retrospectively to even improve performance further? Or is it is there something more fundamental that will always give you gains even if you have large sample sizes? Good question. So overall, I think, uh, first of all, we did try other different like supervised, uh, like self-supervised technique to, to try like we, we tried clustering and a number of other different techniques and uh apparently none of them actually works better like uh, some of them even make the performance worse if by introducing the secondary task and so we were trying to like look, look deeper into like what actually make this app works right and that's that's why we look at the the, the uh, feature space and to figure out actually by by solving this reorientizing task, actually capturing this modernizable part and but but i would not say no to the idea of introducing like more more data like for example can we pre-train a large uh like some serious behavior pre-train model and then apply it or, or fine-tune it on, on this depression model task so that definitely that could be a very interesting idea and, and now we just form a collaboration with google, uh, with google where we can have the potential to access to a large range of the fit data so that could be another chance for us to uh, actually train a train a like a like a, a more large large scale model with a, with a better pre-training, maybe a large, I don't know, time series or behavior data model so that we can do a better job for other downstream tasks. That's something we're very excited to explore in the future work. Yeah, that's great. Um, any other questions from the audience? Hey, Arson. I had a quick question right. for you about um, the usage potentially. Um, for example, like you showcase, you know, correlations with heart rate. I was wondering whether you would have access, you know, if the user agrees, consents to share their, um, let's say, blood pressure data or their blood test panels or maybe even sharing with you the date of the diagnosis that uh, was made by their family physician or, or by a specialist. Um, and whether you see potential with that, for example, you mentioned, yeah, like Fitbit data and maybe like Google or Apple um, apps for like fire uh, EHR data exchange. Yeah, I, these, are, these are exciting directions for us to explore as well. So um, I think one of the, uh, I can like acknowledge the limitation of the current work is like we are focusing on like clinical aspects. Like all our data is collected by the self uh, like self report. Uh, where we would love to introduce more kind of like clinical ver verified, for example, glucose or or blood pressure or any other perspective prescription. That will be adding a, a bunch of more kind of like dimensions of information to our data sets. And you, as you can imagine, if we can kind of build a kind of like a platform to have a multiple source of information, right? We, we, uh, what I have been exploring now is mainly from the smartphones or wearables, which is daily daily devices. Plus more other other things, which can can it be like more? Can can we develop a like a holistic machine learning solutions and also technical solutions to merge these informations? And if one of them is missing, can we still make it work? Like for example, we can imagine some users might provide one domain of the of the, of the data, some others might not. How can we deal with those kind of informations? To is that we get matrix with different kind of like empty cells? How can we make this uh, a a a technical solution to make the model to be able to work across this unit. That will be some exciting directions to explore. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That was super interesting. I, I will go look into your, uh, yeah, like multi-institutional data sets. Yes, thank you so much, May. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to answer. Any other questions? Okay, so thanks again, Orson. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, I'll keep inviting you for future talks in case you're interested.
100 percent. please please do i definitely would love to see more uh talks which is closer to IPO. that's a good learning experience for me as well thank you so much Ahmed, and thank you yeah. all for attending thanks